What does this odd-looking automobile have to do with this sleek-looking Mach 2 jet fighter? We're going to tell you in this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. We're going to be looking at the Fairchild Republic Experimental Safety Vehicle, or ESV, a car that used aviation technology to revolutionize automotive design. Cars and planes have been linked together since the beginning of aviation. Not many people realize that it was a championship racing driver named Eddie Rickenbacker who became the leading American ace of World War I. And you've heard the term form follows function. Here we see a 1966 Corvette Stingray with a 1966 Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird, both machines just evoking speed and elegance. But this story begins in 1928 at the New York Auto Show. A precocious young lad at 13 years old named George Hildebrand, seen at Upper Right, uh, got a bunch of friends together and formed the Junior Automobile Investigation Club. Uh, and this was all a ploy to go to the show on a press pass. But in exchange, he wrote an article for Automobile Topics, one of the leading automotive publications of that era. Young George was designing uh, cars like this. Uh, he was really big on wire wheels. And by his uh, mid-teens, he was apprenticing at the Rolston Body Company in New York, uh, designing cars like this Duesenberg. But uh, George Hildebrand was my uncle, and he was a great inspiration for my career. He was the first person I ever knew who exuded passion for uh, his designs and for aviation. Uh, and uh, it was just a major impact on my, my own artistic uh, endeavors. In 1939, George had his dream job with General Motors and became a stylist for the Cadillac division, working under a rising star named Bill Mitchell. Bill Mitchell was the father of the Corvette, the Buick Riviera, and other uh, designs later in his career. But being from New York, George yearned for the uh, lights of the big city once again and answered an ad from Republic Aviation Corporation in Farmingdale, Long Island, looking for automotive engineers to design canopies uh, and cockpit areas for uh, fighter aircraft at the beginning of World War II. Specifically, the birdcage canopies of the P-47 Thunderbolt and other airplanes of this era uh, restricted pilot visibility in dogfights. And so the solution was George's first patent, the bubble canopy on the P-47D. His next project was the nose section of a large four engine prototype photo recon airplane. Uh, the idea here was to meet an Air Force requirement for 360 degree visibility uh, forward uh, for the flight crew. That airplane was the XR-12 Rainbow seen in flight here. It is the world's fastest to this day, the world's fastest four engine piston powered aircraft. It flew 462 miles an hour at 40,000 feet. Here we see the uh, XR-12, the P-47, and a new airplane on the right, the Thunderbolt Amphibian, which was Republic's attempt at uh, entering the light plane market. Uncle George is leaning on the wheel of the P-47. You see him here in his uh, trademark three-piece suit minus the jacket. He always wore the vest because he was a designer. And here we see him on the production line for what became the uh, Republic CB, uh, the little amphibian uh, built by the company in 1946. Using his automotive roots, he designed the interior of the CB specifically to look like a car, which enhanced the marketing for uh, pilots' wives, as it said in the brochure. But uh, combining the automotive look and uh, a yacht that he designed in 1946 for an outside client, you put those two elements together with an airplane and you have the RC3CB seen here. And uh, the cabin, which George designed, is uh, very distinctive on this airplane. With the arrival of the jet age, uh, George was tasked with uh, cockpit canopy and pilot enclosures and pilot safety. And his second patent was the cantilever canopy on the F-84 and RF-84 aircraft. More importantly, he was involved in uh, uh, crash survivability and uh, uh, energy absorbing structure. Uh, what you see here is a uh, F-84F Thunderstreak from the Belgian Air Force that was involved in a mid-air collision. 
And the famous story is that the pilot didn't have a clue that the front of the airplane was missing until he hopped out and uh, took a look at the airplane from the front, but he landed without a scratch. In the supersonic era, the Republic F-105 Thunder Chief uh, really uh, set the stage for uh, crash survivability at supersonic speeds. And this is George's third patent, the rocket-powered F-105 ejection seat. This was a zero-zero seat, which meant uh, you needed uh, zero airspeed and zero altitude, uh, and it would still be effective. Uh, it was the first US seat uh, produced that went from ejection initiation to a full canopy parachute in under three seconds in mode one. Uh, by comparison today, uh, some of the advanced seats will uh, do that same cycle in 1.8 seconds. George worked closely with this gentleman uh, throughout his career, Dr. John Paul Stapp, who was a colonel in the Air Force and a flight surgeon. Dr. Stapp dedicated his entire career to crash survivability. He was known as the fastest man on earth for riding rocket sleds, dis uh, discovering uh, uh, deceleration uh, properties and uh, designing devices to help pilots survive. He rode a sled at 635 miles an hour to zero in 200 feet. That was this device, the Sonic Wind, built by Northrop and tested at the Holloman, New Mexico track. Again, 635 miles an hour uh, and stopping uh, and experiencing 40 Gs for a, a second. He did survive that and prove the viability of the uh, new safety restraint devices that were being tested on the sled. And those translated to uh, uh, production aircraft with uh, webbing and harnesses that you see here uh, that allowed survivability at very high speed and high energy uh, ejections. But this is the intersection of the jet plane and the automobile, the Firebird uh, concept car from General Motors. And uh, I have a question for you. Can you find the real jet in this group of photos? Yeah, that's an RF-84 Thunder Flash on the right. And above that photo is the Firebird 3. Uh, the gentleman standing next to the car was George's old boss, Bill Mitchell. By the mid-1960s, the F-105 had uh, ended its production run, and the Fair Republic Company had been uh, acquired by Fairchild Hiller. And at this point, George proposed the idea of using aviation technology and safety methodology uh, to improve automotive safety. By the mid-1960s, there were more people than ever driving on U.S. roads. Uh, it was the be beginning of the muscle car era. Cars were becoming more powerful. And sadly, automotive uh, fatalities were rising at an alarming rate. In 1965 alone, more than 65,000 people lost their lives in automotive accidents, and that includes pedestrians. At that same time, New York State enacted a safety car research program. Uh, State Senator Edward Spino, seen in the center of this photograph, had lost a dear friend in a car accident years before and uh, made it his quest to solve this problem by enacting legislation. Uh, this intersected nicely with uh, George's design. And so New York State uh, collaborated with Republic uh, for what was called the New York State Safety Car. George gave many presentations to uh, different automotive companies that flew to Farmingdale uh, to learn about these studies. Uh, here we see him briefing the team from Mercedes-Benz and other companies that flew to New York uh, were Toyota, Volvo, and Saab. But let's take a look at a uh, 1960 Pontiac to show the uh, style of automotive interior that day. This was the epitome of industrial design, uh, quite beautiful, quite stylish. But uh, from a, a safety standpoint, there were some uh, things that uh, could have been improved. Uh, you've got the A-pillar for the wraparound windshield, uh, literally at the driver's shoulder. Uh, the uh, uh, steering wheel is on a, a, a fixed a column uh, with uh, chrome and uh, the plastic ring, uh, the uh, hard surfaces of the dashboard, no seat belts, and uh, this did not allow survivability in high impact, fr especially frontal high impact uh, accidents. One of the solutions was the uh, instrument panel itself in the car, which had a totally different look and was modeled after uh, aircraft panels. If you uh, if you fly airplanes, you know the uh, color-coded airspeed indicator with the green, yellow, and red arc uh, seen here on the speedometer of the car. On the left side of the panel was a pictogram 
showing the automobile uh, as a schematic uh, with uh, lights that were possibly uh, out or doors that were open in a jar. And there was a new device called an emergency flasher, uh, which flashed uh, all uh, extremities of the lights on the car to warn uh, other motorists if the car was disabled on the side of the road. On the right side of the panel, you had an aviation type annunciator panel with all sorts of emergency warnings. And uh, as you know, the last item on a pre-takeoff checklist is all lights out and you are good to go. By this point, the uh, aviation industry was taking note of this uh, design and study. And here we have an article in Aviation Week magazine. Let's take a look at the interior of the car. It's uh, padded surfaces. Uh, the device on the roof is a uh, combination periscopic uh, rear view mirror system and a lighting system, which we'll discuss uh, in a little more detail in a moment. But uh, you had fully padded door panels, uh, warning stripes on the end of the door, which became lights uh, later on. And uh, take a look at the steering wheel. You've got this device in the center, uh, which contained essentially a pillow that exploded out of the middle of the steering wheel in the event of a crash, which would save your face from going through the windshield. Uh, this was uh, scoffed uh, by the press initially and uh, actually laughed at by the public. Uh, but of course, this became the progenitor of the uh, airbag in today's cars. In 1971, the Department of Transportation took note of the study and issued a $5 million contract for Fairchild Republic to build two operating rolling uh, prototype cars. Uh, this is a model of what those cars look like. It uh, had uh, 135 different safety innovations uh, that were going to be tested. Uh, here you see the front bumper is extended. Uh, the front bumper came out uh, to about two feet uh, when the car was uh, traveling more than 30 miles per hour, again, for energy absorption in a, in a crash. Uh, the door handles were flush. The uh, gas filler was on the side of the car rather than in the rear to avoid uh, rear end impacts and, and fires. The device on the roof of the car uh, was a, a modification of that periscopic system, and it contained three lights, a green, yellow, and red light to show traffic behind the car that the car was either under acceleration, coasting, or coming to a stop. And this allowed uh, drivers uh, much more uh, visibility of the, uh, of the braking system rather than looking down to see uh, brake lights on, on the end of the car. You'll also notice the hood is painted flat black. Why is that? Well, it's modeled after jet airplanes that had anti-glare panels forward of the uh, windshield and uh, on this airplane uh, inboard on the tip tank, again, to reduce glare and improve safety. The styling of the car uh, was done by Raymond Lowy and this rendering was done by Sid Mead. And this is the uh, selling of the idea of the car to the public. The mock-up was unveiled to the public uh, in Republic's uh, um, product display center. Uh, and uh, ironically, this was the same hall uh, in which the F-105 was delivered to the Air Force. The frame of the car, designed like uh, uh, aviation structure for uh, energy absorption, had hydraulic arms uh, for the front and rear bumpers and all sorts of crash absorbing uh, material. And here's the actual car under construction in a jig at Farmingdale in the same plant. Here's the car being lifted into the final assembly area. And here we see uh, Fairchild Republic President Ed Yule in the driver's seat with George looking on at the right. Um, you'll notice this building is quite famous. This is the final assembly hall, building 17 for Republic Aviation. And it is the same floor and the same spot that this F-105 is uh, shown here in this photo in the same building. And just the way new jet airplanes were photographed on the taxiways and runways at Republic on their rollout, so was the safety car with the plant in the background. In April of 1972, the uh, cars were de delivered to the Department of Transportation in Washington, DC. And here we see the uh, public unveiling with Secretary of uh, Transportation, John Volpe sitting on the extended safety bumper. And George, like a proud uh, papa, uh, it was a very important day for his, his career, the delivery of his, uh, his design. The actual cars were uh, transported to the uh, DOT proving grounds uh, near uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, the drivetrains were donated by the Chrysler Corporation. Uh, they were uh, 340 cubic inch V8 engines 
The cars had torque flight uh, automatic transmissions and anti-lock braking systems. The next step was the DOT testing of all the safety devices on the car, including the final test, a barrier impact at 50 miles per hour. And uh, the cars were rammed into this uh, barrier at that speed. This is what the uh, automobile looked like after the 50 mile per hour impact. By comparison, let me show you a, a production car of that same era after an impact into the same barrier at 50 miles per hour. Quite a difference. So what came of all this technology? Well, you have the uh, covered headlights, the rounded corners, uh, the flush door handles, the uh, curved side glass, flat windshield to reduce glare, all sorts of uh, designs uh, in, in, intended to increase uh, passenger survivability in accidents. And by the mid 1980s, cars adapted many of those features as you see here. Oh yes, that device on the roof. Well, they simplified that and just kept the red brake light. And that became the high mounted brake light legislated into automotive design in 1986. The purpose of this device was to allow drivers to see traffic well ahead of where they were. Uh, in, in this case, you're up high in a truck or an SUV and you can see cars stopping well ahead. Uh, and this reduced uh, the uh, rear end pileup accidents which were quite, co quite common in that uh, time period. Those interiors with all sorts of handles and knobs and uh, devices that would uh, create injury and accidents uh, became this type of interior with soft padded material, airbags for the driver and passenger, and all sorts of recessed uh, uh, areas for controls uh, that would not uh, cause injury. And I might mention that the controls were movable. Uh, the steering column, instead of being a fixed rod, uh, connected to the front wheels uh, was now adjustable for height and angle uh, for optimum safety for the driver. And the child safety seat uh, resulted from the uh, ESV as well. You had uh, headrest, shoulder and hip restraints and a five-way uh, safety harness with a quick release. And that came from this, the ejection seat. And again, all part of the technology that created the Mach 2 jet fighter in the early 1960s. So the safety car made uh, quite an impact on the world and that 65,000 uh, loss rate uh, from automotive accidents in uh, the mid 1960s was reduced to uh, less than half. 30,000 people were lost in uh, car accidents by the end of the 20th century proving that those devices definitely worked. And uh, you'll notice that most of those innovations are in every car that we drive to this day. So there you have it, the story of the Fairchild Republic ESV. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And as always, special thanks to uh, the folks that helped make this possible. Tony Landis for the wonderful photography, Dr. Chris Ledette for introducing me to John Paul Stapp, and Howard Kaufman, the proud owner of the red Corvette seen with the SR-71. So until next time, take care.